So I wanted a 4K TV, but I didn't want to spend hundreds of dollars on one. And I had an idea, what if I could get my hands on a broken one and then fix it, and then I'll have one. And that's what I did. I was able to find a 65 inch 4K TV on Craigslist that was broken for a very great deal. I brought it home, diagnosed it, and figured out that it only needed 47 cents worth of parts to get it running again. And it's been running great. So let me walk you through the whole process from getting the TV to fixing it. Let's go. So the story begins more than a year ago when I searched online locally for a TV that I could fix. I used the search terms broken 4K TV and I saved a search on Craigslist. About two or three months later, I got an alert for a match. So this is what I've been waiting for, a 4K TV that's broken, it won't power on, and they want 200 bucks for it. But does it have a cracked screen? No, awesome, I've gotta get my hands on this TV. So I offer the seller $150 and he takes it. He even has the original box and the styrofoam, which makes transportation a breeze. Now I'm so eager to figure this one out and I plug it in and yes, there's no power, nothing works. So I take all the screws off the back and I open it up. If you have this same model, make sure that when you're taking off the back, you don't just pull it real hard. There's an actual wire on the right hand side that's connected. You can see it right here. It's the wire that goes to the input bar over to the main board. So just make sure you disconnect that before the, the back plastic housing can be completely free. Next, I powered on and I noticed something interesting. The first thing I notice is a flashing light on the main board, which I later learned is supposed to be a solid color. And I also notice that there's a clicking sound coming from the power supply. Can you hear that? Okay, so the problem is most likely with either the power supply or the main board. So the next thing I do is I go to the internet and I type in the model number and the words no power. And I start scrolling through the results, looking for clues that are gonna help me diagnose what's wrong with this TV. And in a forum, I find someone that has the exact same model and has a problem with their power board. They found a fluctuation on the 12 volt line of the power board. They diagnosed it and found that there was a bad resistor and a bad diode. I'm like, I gotta get my board out of this TV to see if I had the same bad resistor and bad diode. But the big question is, is this a common problem on this power board? Or is this unique to this person's board who posted in the forum? So the forum post gave the location of the bad resistor. I get in with a closer look with my trusty magnification headset and I put it on and this is what I see. And I get a little closer and I start laughing. Look, that resistor has a hole in it. Oh man, it's the same problem, or at least it seems like it, as this other person had. And to verify, I pull out my multimeter and I take a look at this resistor, and you see it's registering in the mega ohms, which is means the thing is toast. You can just compare it to the one above it, which is in the normal range, nine kilo ohms. So the diode is next. It's the next component down from the resistor. And a diode like this should, you know, maybe have a half a volt drop across it. You can see it's not even close. If I flip it around the other direction, uh, there should be no voltage drop, but you can see there's something. So this diode is bad. So far, it's looking like I'm having the exact same problem as the person on the internet post. So the next thing I check for is the fluctuation on the 12 volt line. You can see me pointing to it here. I have the board plugged in and I'm gonna ground my black pin to the corner of the board. And for some reason on this board, it's labeled 12 volts, but it really should be 19 volts. You can see the fluctuation I'm getting there. So I have the exact same problem that this person described. So now I have a pretty good idea what's wrong with this power board and it's time to buy some parts. If you're curious about the parts that I purchased or any of the tools that I've used in this video, check the description below. I'll put links to all of them. So I went online to search for parts and the best replacements were from an American distributor. 10 cents for the resistor and 37 cents for the diode. 47 cents total with 499 shipping. So here is the new resistor. I need my fine tweezers to work with it because it's three millimeters across. And by means of comparison, I have the resistor and diode on a dime so you can get a sense of the size of these parts. So it's time to take the old resistor off and put on the new one. That sound you hear is my fume extractor fan. 
I'll walk you through what I'm doing here. The first thing I'm doing is putting on some flux, which will help the soldering process. Next, I'm going to put some fresh solder on these joints, and that will enable me to wick away the solder easier with some copper braid. Now, there are lots of different ways I could remove this resistor from the board. I'm showing you how to do it with copper braid, but I could also use hot air and tweezers, for example. After I put the new resistor on, I'll pull out my hot tweezers and I'll show you how you can remove it with them. But they are expensive, and unless you do this work a lot and find them helpful, most people don't need them. Copper braid and soldering iron work just fine together. Now when you melt the solder and you place the braid on it, the metals want to bond with the copper, so it looks like it's almost getting sucked up. The addition of fresh solder and flux help wick it away onto the braid much easier. Now the resistor here has some adhesive underneath it, so I need to push on it carefully while using my soldering iron to keep the one side molten. Now I do still have a minute amount of solder on the left side there, but it shouldn't be any issue. I just need to push carefully and it should pop right off. Now for a bit of extra measure, I'm gonna clean up these pads a little bit. You really don't need to since most of the original solder is gone, but it can't hurt. So I'll speed things up a little bit here so we can get to the part where we put in the new resistor. So I'm adding a small amount of solder on these pads and as soon as I put the solder on the second pad, I realized that I shouldn't have done that. Since only one side will melt at a time, it may mean that the resistor won't sit as flush with the board, but since I can push down on it with my tweezers, while I melt one side at a time, uh, it'll be totally fine. If you do this at home, uh, put down one side first, secure the resistor, then add solder to the second pad. Now, of course, I could have gotten out my braid and removed it and done it again, but, you know, that resistor is not going anywhere. So I'm pressing firmly down with the tweezers on the resistor to so try to get it as flat as possible. And the solder is melting on the other side, and so that looks really good. I wanted to show you another way you could take a component like this off the board using something called hot tweezers. This thing plugs into my soldering station and it is what the name implies. It pinches together like tweezers, but each side is a hot iron, allowing you to remove or add small components faster. Like I said, it's an expensive tool and I don't use it a whole lot, but sometimes it's the very tool you need for the job. You can see here how much quicker that was to remove and add the resistor back on. Now it is time to remove the diode. I'll be using the same method to remove the solder like I did for the resistor, adding some flux, adding fresh solder, and then using the copper braid to remove the solder. I'll be speeding some of this up as we go along. One of the questions I get a lot is, how did you get into this kind of thing? And it's funny because what got me into repairing electronics was watching a YouTube video. I remember watching a guy pull an old TV out of the trash and he fixed it for like a dollar. And I thought, I can do that. And so that was my inspiration. I had seen TVs stacked up near a local electronics store's dumpster and I asked them for permission to take them. And they said, yes, you can. And that began a journey of learning how to fix TVs and from there learning to repair all kinds of different things. So I'm trying to remove all the excess solder to make sure that the leads are loose. And at this point, I could clip them off or bend the leads in order to get the diode out. Make sure you bend your new diode's leads into the proper shape. You can use the old one as a guide and definitely make sure to put it in the correct orientation. There's even a little icon printed on the board to help you. With your finger holding the diode in place, flip the board over and then you can bend the pins so that it will hold itself in place and allow you both hands free to solder it in. Really excited to apply power to this board after I'm finished with this diode to see if these two components are all that it needed. There's always this sense of anticipation when you work on electronics and you plug it in. Is something gonna pop? Is something gonna blow up? Or will it just work fine? I need to clip these leads off the diode and then I get to find out. Oh, and also remember to use some isopropyl alcohol and clean up any leftover flux residue that might still be on the board. Okay, one of the moments of truth I plugged in this board after I put in those two parts, and let's see if I get that fluctuation or not, or if it has disappeared. Solid 19 volts. That fluctuation is gone, so that's a really good sign that this TV is gonna work, so I can't wait to connect it back up and hit the power button. So if you like to repair things and you're like me, 
this is the moment you have so much excitement for and you also dread. Will it work? So I plug it in and look, the light is solid. The TV seems to be working. This is so awesome. You can even hear the clicking is gone. Nothing. Sweet. Let me turn the TV around and we'll have the real moment of truth. Remember when I bought this TV? It wouldn't power on and 47 cents worth of parts later, let's see if it actually shows an image on the screen. Yes, there's the Vizio logo. It is working. That was a lot of fun. So overall, I spent $150 for the TV, 47 cents for the parts, $4.99 for shipping, for a grand total of $155.46. The TV has been working great and I haven't had any problems with it. Our family has been enjoying the 4K experience at a fraction of the cost of a new TV. My name is Reese, and I hope you enjoyed this video. All the time people are throwing away or selling broken items and a whole new world opens up when you know how to repair them. Plus it saves a lot of money. So please consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell and joining me on this journey of repair. Now I have a special question for you. Since I like to fix things, I'd love to hear from you. What has been your most favorite repair? Please post the answer to that or questions or comments that you have down below in the comment section. I would love to hear from you and see you at the next repair.